Welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. This is a space we've created to explore the components of diversity, inclusion, and cultural competency. Cultural competency. And all of the ways in which these components present themselves in our professional and personal lives. Be it language, culture, socioeconomic class, gender, race, ability level, age, or so many other identifiers. Everything begins with a conversation. conversation. Join us in this space where we seek to empower, educate, and uplift by creating authentic conversations on issues that affect us every day in every way. We look forward to you joining us in our discussions with everyone from thought leaders, diversity and inclusion strategists, students to CEOs in the corporate, education, and nonprofit sectors. Let's discuss how we can better understand differences and leverage commonality. Let's do away with political correctness, explore ideation, build community, and create allies. Let's start an authentic conversation. This is the Global Fluency Podcast, and this is Bertine Crevacore West. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. I am your host, Bertine Krevacor west and I'm delighted to have with me today Dawn Christian. She's an Associate Director of Oncology Learning Strategy at AstraZeneca. Dawn, welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. Hi, Bertine. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Oh, I'm so delighted to have you. So I'm going to tell our listeners a little bit about you. Dawn is a highly effective, collaborative, strategic change agent, and she's got a track record of leading global cross-functional teams, building and implementing innovative diversity and inclusion initiatives. She's a leader with cultural competency, executive presence, and a passion for transformative change in complex environments. She can expertly navigate matrices while building internal and external relationships. Extensive business acumen, building internal and external diversity initiatives for multinational organizations from conceptualization all the way up until execution. Dawn has successfully launched and managed diversity pipeline programs, recruitment of diverse employees while retention, while increasing retention in both race and gender. She's earned an MBA from the Cornell Johnson Graduate School of Management in Product Management. She's earned her MBA in General Management and Exchange from IESE Business School and her Sociology degree from the University of Berkeley, California. Dawn, welcome to our show. Again, thanks so much for having me. I um, am really glad to be here. This uh, conversation is really uh, not only um, something that is pertinent in my professional life, but also um, in my personal life. So I commend you, Bertine, for having the um, conversation, and I'm excited to be a part of that. Oh, that is so awesome. That is so awesome. I really do agree with you that, that these conversations are timely. You know, I feel that um, we are entering a golden age of diversity and inclusion where um, we are exploring multiple levels of diversity. And so, yes, we'll talk about, of course, race and gender, but being that diversity has so many more components, I was particularly excited to get you on the show to hear your perspective and your challenges about what you may have experienced and how you're trying to, to change um, what was the traditional paradigm of diversity and inclusion trainings for companies and for individuals. Great, so, I'm excited. So Don, tell us a little bit about yourself and what led to you working in this field. Yes. Um, so, yes, the bio, thank you for that background. But really and honestly, the short and, and truly authentic answer to this is simply the lack of representation. I myself am an African-American woman. Um, I have worked in biotechnology and pharmaceuticals now post-business school, um, 11 going on 12 years. But um, prior to that, 10 years prior to attending business school, I um, was an active staffing recruiter at a leading biotechnology company. Um, and, and there, I was really held accountable for recruiting top talent, but also um, uh, had the first opportunity to establish what um, you would call now a diversity and inclusion charter. Um, but if we do the math on that, um, looking back almost 20 years ago, Diversity and inclusion um, 
may or may not have been um, established broadly across larger companies, um, and especially um, during that timeline, was not quite um, the the established term or terminology that we see today and across, um, you know, you you name it, company websites or charters, what have you. Um, but the challenge really for me and the reason why I continue to um, work with this in this field of inclusion and diversity has been um, that not much has changed um, since that first job um, in biotechnology over 20 years ago in terms of the metrics and the results of um, diversity and inclusion um, when we look at uh, representation specifically, which is where a lot of folks go. But um, to your point, the evolution um, in the paradigm shift of the conversation of diversity and inclusion. And you will see me um, purposely speaking to inclusion and diversity and leading with that word inclusion um, and then diversity. And that is um, on purpose. And I, I think I'll pause there um, so that we can continue with the conversation. But I, I do think you are right. We are at a point in time in our society globally where uh, this is timely and um, that real conversations are happening. I, I love that you said that. Um, I love that you mentioned inclusion because for me, um, that is very that, that resonates very deeply with me on a personal and professional level, um, simply because I think, um, I do believe in that saying that I believe Rena Meyer stated it, and I'm paraphrasing, but um, diversity is being invited to the party, inclusion is being asked to dance. And I think to myself, how many times um, have I been invited to a party and yet no one's interacted with me? Right, um, by simply by simply being different and considered an other, where I might have many um, things in common with people and and essentially being asked to dance in a sense, right? Um, if they right. If were able to have authentic conversations with one another, because I think having different looking faces, um, that to me is diversity um, on, the, on the, like, uh, the, the tip of the iceberg of diversity because diversity has multiple components. But having differences present, that is diversity. But then when those differences are able to interact in a way that's meaningful to all of them, that to me is what is powerful. That to me is inclusion. And so I, I love that you mentioned representation because I was just having a conversation the other day about representation Presentation, um, particularly um, for women of color and why that is so very important, not only for ourselves as women of color, but for our male white counterparts, our, our female white counterparts, uh, because every, every movement requires allies and diversity and inclusion is not only beneficial to the person being asked to dance per se, um, but to the asker, right? I think that is so very vital. It's very true. And, and that's where we get into these conversations of unconscious bias and then the concept of in-group, out-group dynamics, um, not only in the workplace, but you could see these, you know, in schools. You could see this in any type of organization or, um, you know, institution, if you will. Um, one of the great things, and I think um, you're really getting at this, this point of, are you even asked? Are you even included? Um, and when I think about that, and we often think about discrimination as a very negative term, um, and in a lot of ways it is, but there are these unconscious biases that um, have been explored, and one of the most uh, probably prominent experiments has been um, the brown-eyed, blue-eyed um, experiment that Jane Elliott had um, conducted, and this was literally one day after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, Jane Elliott was a, I believe, a fourth grade teacher. Um, and she, in a um, Midwest town, all white, um, was, was astute enough and authentic enough and a, had enough awareness, self and otherwise, to conduct this experiment, splitting up her uh, fourth grade class um, with attributes 
um, that would make either the brown eyed group or the blue eyed group the dominant group. And I'll be quick about the results in the sense that once these children had experienced discrimination, it actually led them to be more aware of this in-group, out-group dynamic, and thus led them to be more aware of where they were and were not being inclusive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, she then went back to the same groups of students, I think about 17 years later, and those same people spoke about after experiencing exclusion, they then became more astute and aware of how to conduct themselves as a more inclusive person. Um, and so when we talk about um, the inclusion factor and what that means, I think for me, inclusion opens the door for diversity. Um, and some folks can, you know, have different perspectives about that. But when you prioritize building a culture of inclusion um, and establish what that means, and by being able to establish that you have to be very, you have to be very astute and very aware of where the exclusion is happening and what the common and collective information biases are within the company or within the environment or the group that need to be addressed so that folks can feel the psychological safety um, and the trust that will then institutionalize and create an environment for and a culture for inclusion. And then that itself will lead people to be less apprehensive, to share who they authentically are, who whether that's by representation of group, sex, gender, um, you know, religious beliefs, even background. Do you have an MBA or don't you? Are you a scientist or aren't you? These people will be less apprehensive to share a different idea or a different perspective. And that then fosters inclusion and leads for more conversation that is diverse, whether that's diverse representation by the way that most of us think about it in sex and gender um, or uh, racial background or ethnicity, or whether that's diverse diversity of thought. And so I know I've given you kind of a, a, a lot to work with here, but I think um, for me, once you prioritize the culture of inclusion, you establish what it means to pull this through and create a, a culture of inclusion and diversity. So I prioritize inclusion um, and then hopefully um, that will then support um, the development of a culture of diversity. Dawn, I love the gems that you just shared with all of us. I, I have so many points that I wanna to touch upon with you, but I do love that you, you, you flipped it really right? Um, you're putting inclusion beforehand as the driver to diversity. I really, I think that is, that's very different from the traditional paradigm. And I think that's, that's what's been the problem um, is that most of us have followed or have been taught to follow this traditional paradigm of what diversity is. And I find that that's such a limited view. And so when we, when we do prioritize inclusion, I, I do agree with you that it would drive um, the doors to diversity open. Um, and that experiment that you mentioned, I, I really, I remember seeing it. I, I remember seeing the, the film. I think I was watching um, a YouTube video and, and I was doing some research on diversity and inclusion and this video popped up with the teacher separating the blue and the, the um, brown eyed children. And I remember one thing very specifically is that the children innately felt a sense of injustice um, when, when this tribalism was sort of created. And, and I dare say that would impact us that all, if we think about this and apply it to society, the way that that, that impacts all of us, thinking that one group um, for whatever reason will have um, an advantage and another group does not. Um, and I think I, I felt saddened 
that children were part of this experiment, but um, I was also very hopeful because children can understand things at a very basic level and express them um, to us and mirror them to us um, in a way where we would all be empathetic to receiving that information, right? And so when the parents were watching um, the videotape of this, of their children, um, they, the camera also um, captured the parents' reactions and the parents were astounded. Right, they were they were just blown away and they were saddened. And I think this allowed them to empathize with everyone that had been made to feel excluded uh, for whatever reason, you know. And that unconscious bias that people do have, um, and and I say we all have a level of unconscious bias um, by sheer virtue of us not exposing ourselves or being or being exposed um, to people that are different from us. You know, that may be um, based on race, it may be based on culture and language, socioeconomic status, ability level, job, um, anything like that, education. Um, but I love too that you mentioned having psychological safety. Uh, that to me is paramount in order for people to have an authentic relationship with each other, which begins with authentic conversations and by using words that are actually appropriate. Um, I, I'm a believer um, that political correctness is, is very inaccurate and it creates a lot of distortions and it's, it's a safety zone where people feel they can tiptoe around issues. But, but I do believe that in order for us to get to the issues at hand, we have to go through them. But before we can go through them, we do have to create this air of psychological safety. That's absolutely right. And I think um, where you look at a couple of things that you've said have, have triggered a couple of thoughts. And I think one of them is that when you have life experiences, it creates sort of a bond, right? And one of the skills that organizations can use in order to establish this space of inclusion is if managers and leaders were to institutionalize or to establish a practice of storytelling mm. that allows for people to share from a common experience. You can ask, um, what was one of the first times where you um, failed at work? What were you doing? What was the goal? And what, what were you doing? And how did you fail? And, and what was your experience? What did you learn from that, right? And if you went around the room, couple of things that have been established there. You've taken something that is vulnerable, right? Nobody at work wants to talk about a failure, right? But the whole room, including the person leading the meeting, is going to share by way of a story. And they're going to volunteer what that is. And by establishing that, that safety, like this is, everybody's going to do this, and it's safe for us to talk about that, right? And it doesn't have to be this job. You can establish, it doesn't have to be this job. It can be when you're a kid, your first job, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so that people can feel like, oh, if I say something about where I am currently, is that going to, you know, they don't have to worry about that. You eliminate the apprehension as much as possible. Then you kind of build a sense of likeness because other people are sharing that this is a human thing, failure. It happens, right? And that we all can learn from failure. And, and so it's not because I was a female or a millennial or, uh, you know, disabled or a veteran. It was because I am human and this just kind of happens at all levels. Mm -hmm. And then what that does is, to your point, invites those people to the party to not only be in the room and standing up against the wall, but in the middle of the floor, in the middle of the dance circle, with the focus on them and it being okay and everybody celebrating that that experience is okay. Um, and so you've kind of opened this psychological safety that has built trust and then also has made people who may have thought by way of because I'm a male or a female or African American or Asian or I, you know, English is a second language, I am different it has now kind of shifted that paradigm to I am human, authentically like others and have like experiences. And now we can really talk about the things that 
are important, like what we've learned from the failures that we all share and how we can take our diverse experiences in those failures to build a better practice or to learn from one another. And so I think, you know, by building activities like that, you know, not everyone has, you know, access to trust falls and what have you by way of, but by way of kind of creating a space where you can authentically share an experience and story tell it's a capability that, um, you know, most folks have um, to be able to, if provided the opportunity to share, um, you know, who they are, what they are, and what has inspired them to, um, to work at the place or have the pr perspective that they have, and why maybe their perspective being different from the main group of representation at a company is as important as what the larger group may share. So it gets us away from that collective bias. Wow, I love that. That took me on a journey. That really did. Um, because while you were saying that, I, I was envisioning myself. How would I answer that question? And, and how would some of my peers answer that question? And, and what, what would we see that, that we'd have alike? And what would we see that is different? But I, I love that, that idea of creating psychological safety. I feel that it's, um, it's really necessary um, for people to be able to share their, their authentic stories. I truly think it is. Now we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor. Westbridge Solutions is a professional training company focusing on diversity, inclusion, cultural competence, and soft skills trainings. Westbridge Solutions offers a variety of innovative training courses, both in-person and online, live and self-paced. Their clients include corporations, government organizations, healthcare organizations, the nonprofit sector, universities, and individuals such as yourself. Through their rigorous training programs, trainees learn to understand differences, leverage commonalities, and achieve organizational, professional, and personal actualization. To learn more about Westbridge Solutions, please feel free to visit their website at www.westgrouptraining.com or follow them on social media on Facebook and Instagram. Westbridge Solutions, empowering professionals for success. So I'm going to ask you then my next question. So with regard to the work that you do, what are some of the challenges involved with building diversity and inclusion initiatives? Yeah, I think um, one portion that we have not so much um, spoken about has been that support, endorsement, and sponsorship and accountability um, at the CEO executive leadership level um, and that has been pulled through and established um, at all levels. And when you look at it, at that, when I'm talking about that, I'm not just saying that you have a CEO that says diversity and inclusion is, is, is important here, mm -hmm. but that that leader not only expresses that, but defines what diversity means for that company. I myself um, am employed at a company that says defines diversity as diversity of thought and perspective, mm -hmm. which isn't um, isn't a bad thing, but it may not address the inclusive portion of diversity, which extends past thoughts and different ways of thinking that get to a broader perspective of diversity. Um, so it's important to define um, at the executive level what diversity and inclusion actually mean, and then. Um, while at the same time taking the opportunity to make sure that leadership is held accountable, and not only leadership, but that everyone sees that they can participate, be a part of, and are held authentically to the organizational practices and policies that promote and support the importance of inclusion in our workplace. So that means, is it on your performance review? Are there goals that are established? Is the CEO held at the board of directors level, held accountable at any 
level for diversity and inclusion um, practices. Um, and, and so I think, you know, that's a, it's, it's a large goal, but it's not one that um, is unattainable. We've seen companies do this, whether that be a, um, a Citibank or um, a Google, or think about the big companies that everyone talks about as being um, ideal places to work in, in some of the things that they have done, not only um, in employer branding and in, in recruitment marketing, but in actuality to build their culture. Um, another example is a company um, by the name of um, folks either say IDEO or IDEO, which is intentionally, um, it's an innovation company and it's intentionally uh, leadership flat. Um, so it doesn't have a whole lot of layers and levels. The CEO was um, particularly um, specific about eliminating levels and actually publicly um, comments on on levels and, and titles and and publicly will speak to the fact that just because he is the CEO does not mean that he has all the answers are the best answer and, and establishes this psychological trust and environment and culture where that person that might be an entry level manager has just an, as important of a voice as he does. So there's practices, there's policies, um, and I think um, establishing what that, not only what that charter is and what you put on your website, but what do you do in practicum to provide an environment that supports that inclusion um, that will lead to that diversity? Um, and, and how are you making sure that that is pulled through from the very top of the organization? And I specifically spoke to um, not only establishing what it is, but also having that sponsorship and that, um, that um, public declaration and practice for what that means. I really liked what, what you mentioned about an accountability structure and, and where you took us with that. Because I, I think as somebody that, um, now I'm an entrepreneur, but as someone that used to work um, for a company um, apart from my own, I, I always thought that employees, and I, I still hold this, this belief, that employees, when they see um, that an accountability structure has been set, um, and, and as you said, has been supported through some sort of public acknowledgement, right? When they see that um, the CEO or, or whomever that leader is, is not only talking the talk, if you will, but walking the walk as well, that aligns them more with the company's vision and mission. And I do believe that creates a more productive workforce. You know, so when the, when the CEO of a company will say, something like you mentioned, um, I don't know all the answers. I think that's empowering. I think it's empowering um, because we, we all know what we're good at, right? But when we acknowledge um, that we may not be great at something, um, that requires um, some self-introspection and, and honesty on our part internally, but then to make ourselves vulnerable in that sense, right? Um, that I think creates a sense of empathy, the same as the storytelling does. It creates a sense of empathy that, oh, this person, you know, although different from me in one regard is very similar to me in another regard, right? And that I think sets the, sets the tone for community building. And that community could be the professional community, it could be the personal community, but because I see that someone's made themselves vulnerable, um, I feel now that, oh, I'm going to view them with a bit more empathy. And, and I think that would allow us also to extend personal grace um, to people um, and, and not, not tend to just um, harp on one particular you know, difference that we may have, but, but, you know, sometimes at, at work, I think um, people may um, say things that we might not find to be appealing simply because they, again, um, are, are used to a particular way of thinking and that is ingrained in a company culture as well. And so I think it's an opportunity for us to extend some personal grace to them um, because they haven't seen an accountability structure created. Right, and I think when you do have that happen, um, it makes everybody more empathetic, and it makes them want to be better employees. Um, not only.
for their own sake, but for the sake of their fellow employee. I think that the the topic of this empathy and this personal grace are absolutely what we all need to hold ourselves accountable and responsible for having. It is not enough, and it's easy, you know, as a person that can identify with a traditionally, um, you know, d- oppressed or discriminated group by many ways. You know, I'm African American, I'm female, I, you know, in some cases may have been of the younger generation or older generation, depending on where I've been. Um, I'm not a scientist and I work in healthcare, you know, all of these things. Um, so, but I think what you're getting at is that even with myself and this representation that could make someone have the assumption that I have a more diverse perspective or view just by looking at me because you would assume, oh, well, she represents these things. So of course she supports diversity and inclusion is not always true, right? So um, you, you can't, um, it's 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 removing the assumptions mm-hmm. and stereotypes and and creating this space where you do have some empathy because it's not enough to say because you belong to this group you cannot understand mm-hmm. and so therefore I am offended by you and I can say certain things or do certain things or have this perspective or have this empathy but you may not. And so I think what you're getting at is this whole kind of um, space where we're uh, empathetic no matter where we sit Absolutely. within the paradigm, right? Absolutely. Whether we are part of the larger group or the minority group, that we are empathetic to what the other person's perspective may or may not be. And that we provide that personal grace that then institutionalizes that psychological safety and that authenticity that allows for a real authentic conversation about our differences and how it is that we will leverage those differences to become a better climate of inclusion where we are championing diversity, whether that be by thought or representation, as a tool to be better. Absolutely. Um, and so I think, I think you got to some really great points about that being empathetic and, um, and providing that personal grace. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that that was the answer to one of our questions, which was, um, you know, what are some barriers that may exist that can be done to address issues of diversity and inclusion? But let me ask you this question. Uh, what challenges do you think organizations face with regard to recruitment of diverse employees? Yeah, I think um, one of those things we've talked about, right, prioritizing the culture of inclusion. And then establishing a culture of diversity, even though a person or candidate may not yet work at the company. In today's world, especially with social media and especially with the way that recruitment happens oftentimes in a way that is not first personal, right? Like you're not just walking into the HR department and handing in a resume. People are reviewing your LinkedIn profile and, you know, whatever you've posted on whatever job boards and they're going to, um, to websites and looking at what a company says about who they are and what it's like to work there. And then they're making connections on LinkedIn or Facebook with current employees or alumni of the company to better understand what that environment is about. And what I'm getting to is the fact that there's a lot more information about what it's like to work at a company, right? Mm-hmm. As an employee, and employee and candidates are empowered with a lot more information than maybe we were, you know, 10 or 20 years ago. Absolutely. So building this, it, even though what we've talked about before is as an employee, mm-hmm. but as an employee, if we create this environment of inclusion that leads to diversity, it permeates to what we're now seeing people talk about um, 
as employer branding and recruitment marketing. And those companies that are astute enough to understand this have made this a real position that sometimes sits with the marketing department, sometimes sits with the recruitment department, sometimes sits um, kind of above that as a cross-functional um, role to make sure that there's this consultation between the work groups, whether that be by function, that, that gives that counseling and the direction about what it takes to recruit and retain candidates. Mm -hmm. And when that employer branding and recruitment marketing function is established in a company that has prioritized inclusion and diversity, they make this part of their, their goals as a function to sustain this environment and, and culture. This, this role of employer branding and recruitment marketing specifically gets at the culture and dynamics of what it means to recruit, retain candidates. And so I think when we have that, whether that's by function and or by practice, because sometimes that belongs to the HR function, sometimes it belongs to the staffing function, depends on the organization, but, but when that function exists, you have a practice of, of consulting and coaching, hiring managers and work groups to specifically look at their inclusion and diversity um, within their group and what it would take to attract and retain talent that may fall within, you know, that, that, um, that space of diversity and inclusion, whatever that may be for that group, because finance may have a different challenge than IT than marketing, right? One may have less women, one may have, you know, less representation of um, elder people, one may have um, less representation of multilingual people, whatever that is. But you have a strategic, um, you have a strategy in place to address those things and to help promote what it is about the culture that makes it an attractive company to work for. Um, and then also, are the companies outside of prioritizing and establishing in inclusion and diversity practices and operations and then this employer branding piece, are they creating and holding themselves accountable for seeking candidates of diverse backgrounds? Do they know, you know, where they may be lacking or where they may be challenged? And what does diversity mean for this environment? Is it more women? Is it more men? Of a, is it an age thing? What is it that is, you know, lacking or needs to grow? Um, what are the ideologies and skill sets that are, are prominent and needed in these groups? And how do you tie those skill sets to different demographics of people and create a pipeline um, of candidates um, by access. So are you going to places where you can find diverse candidates and can they find you to get back to that whole idea of social media and online recruiting? Not only are, are companies looking in the right places and seeking diversity and inclusion um, through various means and activities, but can these groups actively find you? Um, so are you establishing um, relationships within the community, um, whether that's local community or national or global um, associations? Are there employee resource groups? Is there an active referral program that helps to um, provide access to um, candidates to be able to work at this company where they can witness this um, culture of inclusion and diversity? I really like what you mentioned um, specifically about looking around at the table in a sense to see who's not represented, right? Um, so when you're talking about, you know, the, the, the hiring pipeline, the recruiting pipeline, um, we'd have to go outside of the norm because people have to be able to find us. Um, but then I wonder, you know, um, even a, another colleague mentioned this a while back that um, with their company, they felt that their company was going to the, the traditional colleges in order to recruit personnel in general, but they were missing some key components that would add value to their firm, right? Some key individuals that would add value to their firm, but they had no idea about where to find these individuals. And so one of the 
one of the things that they started to implement, one of the initiatives was to go to community colleges, as an example. And they were able to retain people that they had never even considered before. And what was great about that was not only did they add value to their workforce and to, to their company overall, but they now created an avenue for, for these particular um, community college students to have a different pathway which I thought was was phenomenal. It was something as simple as, you know, who's not here? Can they find us? And where can we find them? You know, and then what yeah. ended up happening was relationship building for one, but also community building. And so um, these, these young people who had a particular path in mind, which was fine, nothing was wrong with that, but now they were given, you know, rather than be like, um, horses in Central Park with the blinders on, right? Rather than just have one course, um, one path to follow, they were now given another world that they had never known. And, and I, I get excited at, at hearing that kind of um, initiative being, you know, um, brought to fruition because now we, we are expanding people's potential, expanding people's opportunities, but we're also creating um, representation. And I think in a certain sense, in, in the longer term of it, creating and investing in generational wealth, generational opportunity, generational education. Because once you empower one person in a community, they are now a representative and they will serve to, to further add to that pipeline. So my next question, and I think, I think we probably answered this, but um, what goals do you recommend that an organization have in place? Because you mentioned strategy, which I think is always very necessary. Companies need to define exactly what diversity and inclusion is. Set specific goals, but then have a strategy in place. So, so what do you recommend they do in order to try to create this transformative type of change? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that we've discussed, and, and again, not to be um, redundant at all, but I think it's paramount that we kind of elevate um, the conversation and the, and the end point that you just had of creating this space of inclusion that gets at where you haven't been and where you need to go. So being specific and explicit about the transformation um, have we not included the community of, in, in, in your example, community colleges? Mm -hmm. Once you've opened that door and said, yes, yes, we'll take you. We want you. You are valuable. What that also does is allows for the person themselves to include themselves, to be less apprehensive about whether or not they are a qualifier to be a part of your strategy, i.e. your recruitment processes, i.e. becoming an employee. Um, and to the other point that she's made of that investment mm -hmm. in that talent and in growing that talent. I currently work in learning and development. And in a lot of ways, people think of learning and development as a space where you look at deficiencies only and then, you know, try to build, the, you know, these, these skills where people may be deficient. But what we also um, want to look at is where people are strong and how do we elevate the attributes that are, they are strong in and make that the asset and the focus of their function and their value to not only the company, but to their own growth. Um, and I think um, when we're specific and explicit about the transformation and establish the goals and be specific about the milestones, the what, when, and how, and who's accountable for upholding them, we then are able to have, again, going back to the, to the buzzwords, authentic, open conversations about what needs to be done and how it gets done. And I think if we also establish the accountability and the sponsorship, at the executive council level and pull that through to the junior levels of the organization, we can help to define the organizational practices and policies which promote and support the importance of inclusion in our workspace. But we have to be authentic about this transformation and authentic about the challenges, but elevate the benefits of that evolution 
as we go through that ch transformative change. So um, I hope that I've addressed that, that question that I think is really about um, creating a space for the conversation, establishing what the goals and milestones are, and establishing a strategy to meet those, and then being very authentic and communicative about the what's going to be done and who's accountable and how everyone can be accountable um, for for creating um, this transformative change and then being authentic about what it means to change. Um, and and I think, you know, if you're if you make it a space where it's not a taboo conversation, um, where it's an open conversation, you've done a, a great bit of the work. Absolutely, absolutely. And and I love just demystifying, destigmatizing um, the conversation because I feel that people are so fearful of even, you know, broaching a particular topic um, that it, it, it kind of holds them in place and it, it doesn't allow them to grow um, as individuals and as an organization. So Don, in conclusion, what's one piece of advice you'd like to impart upon our listeners? Yes, my advice, I think, will go back to where we started, which is, for me, I think, shifting the paradigm and kind of changing the order in which we address um, the, this space. And I, I would say, lead with and, a start, and start with establishing an inclusive environment. I think um, employees become more comfortable with bringing their whole selves to work and being authentic um, where they're able to do that, um, by virtue, this will help to increase trust um, and allowing others to feel comfortable about being authentic and having healthy conflict and ultimately decreasing collective biases and in, out, in and out group dynamics that um, are so prominent um, in a lot of our workspaces. Um, and this can open the door to creating a climate that it truly accepts and supports diversity. And so um, if I were to say anything, I'd say start with inclusive. Um, and I think that will lead the way. Thank you, Don. This has been truly a, a wonderful conversation. I've very much enjoyed speaking with you today. Thank you for being on the show and for sharing not only of your time, but of your perspective and your advice um, with regard to I would, the diversity and inclusion just challenge, journey, strategy, accountability, and implementation. I, I'm delighted that I had the opportunity um, to be introduced to you so you could be on the show today because I think this is, again, a timely conversation, a necessary conversation. And I am very hopeful um, for the challenges being met. I believe that this can happen, but as you said, we need a strategy. We do need to place inclusion as the driver. And, and I think that, you know, conversations like this, um, I'm hoping that our listeners will, will hear this um, at work, on their drive home, you know, share it with their friends and their colleagues and create water cooler conversations based on this. So thank you so much for being a guest on today's episode of the Global Fluency Podcast, Don. And please tell our listeners where they can contact you. Bertine, thank you so much for having me and allowing for this conversation. Again, I commend and champion and support all that you're doing with the Global Fluency Podcast. And I, I hope to continue um, to be a voice for uh, the Global Fluency Podcast and also for um, inclusion and diversity. Please find me on LinkedIn, Dawn Christian. Um, I look forward to linking to you and having more conversations about inclusion and diversity. Thanks for having me on the Global Fluency Podcast, team. This was amazing. Thank you so much, Don. And to all of our listeners out there, let's continue the conversation. Let's keep it going. Join us for another episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. I'm your host, Bertine Crevacor West, and thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. Tune in every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. for our latest episode. Connect with us on our social media. You can find us on Facebook at Global Fluency Podcast and on Instagram at Westbridge Solutions, LLC. Global Fluency Podcast. Understanding differences. Leveraging commonalities. Let's keep the conversation going. Going.